Okay, let's proceed. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Ann O'Connor, and I represent the appellant children who are a 13-year-old boy and a soon-to-be 12-year-old girl who would like to be relieved of the obligation that they visit with their 17-year-old brother. Uh, that obligation was imposed by a juvenile court um, under Section 26B of Chapter 119. Um, and in my client's view and in, in view of the record, actually, that order does not, uh, is not in their best interests. The statute requires that uh, an order for sibling visitation be made in the best interests of the children with whom visitation is sought. The statute doesn't really define, it talks about the children. I take it that that means all of them, both I, the sibling who seeks the visitation plus, right? Correct, Your Honor. Yes, excuse me, but certainly it must be in the best interests of um, the, the uh, children with whom... I'm entirely sure of that, but it certainly isn't only them. Correct, Your Honor. I would agree that it's all three, Your Honor, and that in this case, the judge, um, in his discretion, did find that it's in the best interest of the petitioning sibling, um, but that his findings don't show that he made that determination as to um, my, my clients, and if, in fact, we take his um, a couple statements to that effect as findings that they're not supported um, by the record. And I think what's most telling about the judge's decision is his conclusion, which is, I am ordering these visits because I have no specific reason to believe that they would harm the younger children. Well, what, if we could go back to the statute, what, the word is the child. So are you... It's not, I mean, one way of reading it is it's the, ch the petitioning child, right? Um, I would argue, Your Honor, that that, um, that interpretation would not be consistent with any decision ever made by this court, and we can go back to 1932, Riches versus uh, Forrest, Does that the first and paramount duty of the courts is to consult the best interests of the children in the case before it. Um, so, and I also would point to the three cases that have been decided under the relative to the sibling visitation statute, um, Galvin, Pierce, and Xander, all appeals court decisions. Um, in two of those cases, all three children wanted the visits, and the judge found that it was in all three children's best interests, and the appeals court said, yes, you must make um, specific findings around best interests, and you, the trial judge, must make a specific order. In Pierce, the eld elder child wanted visits with her younger sibling who was being but, but, adopted. Right. Um, I mean, and it, was a, it was in the context of an adoption proceeding. It was in the context, Your Honor, there were motions made in the context of an ongoing, um, I believe it was a 119-26 case, um, and the appeals court determined that um, because the judge, um, pardon me, I'm so sorry, well, no, okay, I, I, I shouldn't have gotten you off. Okay, That's so okay. let's just say all these interests. That, so m move on. I apologize. But the, the order was not made because it was not in the best interest of the younger child with whom the visits were sought. Um, whenever this court has considered visitation with children, be it in the context of uh, post-adoption contact under veto or... Um, de facto parent contact under humans in ENO versus LMM, the court always has made it a requirement that visitation be in the best interest of the child with whom visits yeah, are sought. There, there, this is, it, there's something highly unusual about the, 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 the circumstances of this case, though. The, the, the petitioning child said or did something, and apparently not criminal in nature, but I don't know that, uh, but said something that um, that caused all the children to be taken out of the family. And at the time, the two children that you represent now, I think, were ages three and maybe an infant or a toddler? No, um, Your Honor. When they were placed, they were three and five. When all of the children were, were removed, and by placed, I mean the uh, parents uh, yeah. ascended to a guardianship. But, but, but we're talking about some, were... something that was said that, that caused a rift in the family, and, and at the time, the, 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 the petitioner was only 11 years old, and there seems to be some dispute that they don't like the, the petitioner because of what he said so many years ago. That, um, that doesn't seem to be particularly injurious, uh, especially if, where there's a 60-day a 60, a 60 or a two-month separation that followed from that. If that were it, Your Honor, um, then, then maybe, you know... Uh, it wouldn't seem that injurious, but that's not the case. The case is to 
A sibling group is placed in um, a guardianship because their drug addicted parents are abusing and neglecting them. Um, my clients are the youngest, three and five. For two years, my clients are living with their guardians and with their other siblings. This particular sibling has been traumatized, as all of the siblings has, have been traumatized, but the older, the petitioning sibling has been traumatized the most and is in and out of psychiatric hospitalizations during that two year period. And my clients are witnessing his self injurious behaviors and his violent behaviors and, and are fearful as, as children would be in that situation. Um, and ultimately, th but, that but, child. But didn't the judge want to ease them into maybe some reconciliation? Because by all accounts, Jonathan is now uh, a, a pretty solid kid, stable. Which is. is wonderful for Jonathan and the the trial court properly lauded him for the progress he has made but my clients are not the prize that he wins because he is doing so much better contact with my children must with my clients must be in their best interests and that has not been shown well, is the, the not judge, shown but on but this the judge record. wants to test the waters on it he says let's begin with correspondence and then maybe some supervised visits and we'll go from there Again, Your Honor, the, the contact must be in the best interests of my clients, and there has been no showing on, there is no showing on this record that it is. There is an indication, even though there needn't be, that my clients indeed may be harmed by this. These are children who were traumatized in their biological family. They endured some trauma by witnessing their brother's difficulties. They've endured their parents seeking visitation in Isn't the probate part of the court. record that the trauma that they may be suffering at this point, and this is the part that hasn't been really attended to, is the result of whatever it is that the older child did, they were removed from the home that they believed was their home. So they Precisely. view these, their parents as the two guardians who are taking care of them. And for a children, uh, it could be the case, and it's unclear from this record, because it wasn't developed from their point of view, that they were traumatized as a consequence of being removed for reasons they attribute to Jonathan, but it doesn't matter. They are traumatized. Exactly. And they are, and the consequence of that, there was some indication they couldn't sleep. They weren't, you know. Exactly, Your Honor. Things like that. So um, I have a question. So that's the development of the facts that we don't have because it wasn't focused appropriately, you would argue, on these other two children's best interests. Um, is there any historical context for the current statute, which I have some memory, seems to arise out of an understanding that, and there's literature, I, I believe, that siblings, when their parents are neglectful, tend to look to each other yes. for a source of stability and comfort. And it is in that assumption, in that grouping, that they're looking to each other so that when the system, which is imperfect, must remove them from their parents and place them, they can't always do it together, although they'd like to. So in that context, the statute addresses what would be otherwise harmful and tries to redress that by providing an opportunity for them to see each other, to have that continued stability and solace. Is that, I, I had that's that memory, but I'm not sure. That's precisely right. And even at that, the legislature understood that it is not always going to be the best thing so that there must be a showing that it is reasonable, it is practical, and it is in the best interest of the children. Ms. O'Connor, your time is up. Thank you, Your Thank Honor. You. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Margaret Geary. I represent the Guardians. Um, the Guardians' position is not that visits with Jonathan should never under any circumstances occur. The, petition, the, the position that was taken at trial was they thought these particular kids were still too young. Um, the boy was having some difficulty in school, um, the girl also. Um, there was some involvement with a guidance counselor. Uh, they thought the children should be at least the same age that Jonathan was when, when he filed this petition. That was for starters. Um, secondly, throughout the course of this litigation, which has now lasted close to two and a half years, Jonathan has had the opportunity to say, well, that, that allegation I made against one of the guardians that she criminally injured me, um, which resulted in the loss of her job for four months while the district attorney investigated, which resulted in children being removed from the home 
after a couple of years and significant trauma to them. Um, he's never taken that back. Um, he's never said, no, I, I, that didn't happen. No, I, I was confused. I made it up. Um, he still is maintaining that one of the guardians slashed him with a box cutter, and that particular guardian happens to be a school teacher. Um, they have a significant concern that contact with Jonathan, at least at this point, would result perhaps in more of the same um, concerning behaviors that he had um, back when he was 11 years old. And they have no reason to know to the contrary because they didn't have access to any of his treatment records, any of his DCF records. They basically had to take on faith what was testified to by Jonathan and by the social worker well, at trial. Well, let me ask you about that, and I'm, uh, maybe I'm misremembering, but I thought one of the arguments that DCF makes is that they didn't that they, they didn't want to have any of that material, although I think That was it. testimony given by one of the guardians who was on the witness stand and was asked, um, well, do you want to know anything more about Jonathan? And I think she said, at this point, no. Um, certainly, we were denied discovery um, right through. There were motions in limine filed stating, well, you have to take this out of the jail report. We don't have any discovery. Um, a lot of the pretrial skirmishing related to finding out what was going on with Jonathan at this point in time so the guardians could make an informed decision. So that is, they were deprived of that opportunity. But, but that aside, there's also the issue which, which is developed, um, not really developed in the record either, is whether the um, guardians are entitled to the presumption that their decision um, to hold off on the visitation is entitled to a presumption that it is correct and whether the burden would not have been on Jonathan to prove that his siblings were being injured um, by the failure to have visitation with him. Now that's the presumption that this court established in Blixt, which was the application of Troxell to the, to the grandparent visitation statute. This is um, not completely unrelated to that. Uh, the briefs raise a question, or one brief at least raise a question, whether or not the, the juvenile court had jurisdiction under 119 section 26B or otherwise to order the minor siblings I think that was um, my sister O'Connor's argument. Share that view? Because the question is... I, I, I do as, agree that... What, what is the scope of authority of a guardian? Is it parental as, and, unless and until the probate court orders otherwise? Or well, limits it, the, the scope of authority? Or, you the know, scope of authority seems to be that the, the, the section one of the statute says you have parental authority and then that every section that after that detracts from that. And it says, well, you have parental authority until someone steps up and, and asks the judge to, to second guess your decision making, at which point there doesn't seem to be any standard in the probate court as to what presumption, if any, the guardian's decision making has that it's correct. And that's problematical from a constitutional perspective because the Massachusetts Constitution and the federal constitution both protect families. They protect family integrity. We've had cases, Sophie, Angela recently, saying that children have a right to family integrity. They have a right to feel safe and secure in the family that they're in. Are you suggesting that, a, that a guardian has a constitutional right to make decisions for, for his or her ward? I'm suggesting that the, the guardian's family is entitled to constitutional protection as a family, and that the federal case law, most especially Prince versus Massachusetts, holds that they are entitled as family members to that protection. Moore versus City of East Cleveland also gives that level of protection to a family. And if you're going to say... Can I just, before you go on from the family part, um, I think that's important, but it, as I recall from one of the pleadings, at this point, um, is it still the outstanding order of the probate and family court that the parents have no contact with these two children? That's correct. Okay. So at this moment, at least, all we have is a parental figure with legal access to these children are the two guardians. That is correct. Okay. I think if you, if you think about it and say, well, a guardian's family is subject to extensive regulation by the probate court, but the family of biological parents is not subject to that type of regulation, isn't what you're doing essentially creating two types of families? It, why, why should these two children you know, be any less entitled to the stability and security of having two parents whose decisions are respected? Why should these two children be forced into the probate court every time one of their relati relatives, any time a neighbor, has a disagreement with what the guardians are doing? 
And how are the guardians to run a household, for example, if they have some children in the house that are biological children and some children in the house that are children pursuant to guardianship? How do they make the distinction in terms of the decision? How do they allocate the well, resources? Let's just, let's just stick to this decision, which is about sibling visitation, mm -hmm. not any others. Because it's governed by statute, because the statute suggests that it is available, and I think uh, at least one of the decisions of the appellate court says that includes adoptive parents, so that legal parents, if they have a status higher than guardians, let's assume, even if they did, would be subject to the statutory um, uh, visitation between siblings uh, statute that could be authorized, correct? I think the court has jurisdiction to entertain the case what the appropriate standard of proof should be is a separate question. Yeah, because okay. this court has had the opportunity in Hugo to determine whether siblings were entitled to heightened constitutional protection for their relations with one another. And the determination was that it was essentially a best interest decision, that there weren't any presumptions that siblings were entitled to one thing or another. And it was essentially a best interest determination. Now, a parent being confronted with the statute would probably be able to claim the benefit of Blixt versus Blixt and say, I'm the one who has to deal with the consequences of this decision. I'm the one who knows the children best. Um, I'm entitled to make this decision, at least as a preliminary matter, until someone shows that this decision is harming the kids. But that presumption would apply only to the children under guardianship and would not apply to Jonathan. Correct. It applies to the children that they're responsible for. But doesn't for the judge have to consider the collective interest of all three children in making this decision? I agree that he does. That's absolutely appropriate. What, what the argument here concerns is what are the standards and the burdens of proof that have to be met? Can a judge just walk up essentially to the guardians and say, I disagree with how you're handling the situation. Here's what I'm going to do. And then ask them to implement it, ask them to have to deal with the consequences of it when there's essentially no presumption given that they know what they're doing. Okay, but even, even, I mean, let's be fair, the judge here very carefully considered this issue. He, I mean, this was... The judge didn't consider the issue. The judge ruled that Blixt didn't apply at all, so the issue well, never came up. Okay, um, but, below. I mean, but the judge did make a whole series of findings, including a finding that the guardians were, quote, manifestly unreasonable to make decisions about Jonathan in contact with Jonathan based, and went on to say, on his behavior as an emotionally disturbed 11-year-old. So there, well, is a, there, is a finding that, there is a finding that parents were manifestly unreasonable. So even if you had this presumption, would that language not be sufficient to overcome that presumption? Can't we understand what he said to say, well, to say what he said, that, that, the, that the, the conduct of your clients or the decision of your clients was manifestly unreasonable. First of all, that finding is based upon the assumption that the guardians had, first of all, had completely denied visitation, which is what they hadn't done. And it's also based on the assumption that the guardians had adequate basis of knowledge to make the decision about Jonathan, which the trial court judge himself denied to them. So. They're the ones that know the children best. So why should the judge in the juvenile court, based upon basically maybe a day's worth of testimony, be able to overturn a, a discretion that's been developed by dealing with their family and their children over a period of years? And that's aside from the constitutional the is, the, issue. The problem the judge has is the statute requires him to make a finding of best interests and requires him to make a finding based on the best interest of all the children, including Jonathan. So he has to make that decision. Yes. I'm saying that the decision was made based upon the wrong framework in terms of what the burden of proof was. Uh, we're saying it was Jonathan's burden of proof to prove that his two younger siblings were being harmed by the absence of visitation that particular level of proof is not apparent from the record. So the judge saying it was manifestly unreasonable is based upon a level playing field, as if the judge, the judge had the broad discretion the same as he would in any other type of um, case without... They could only be unreasonable if the judge has the right on the same level that they do to make the decision. Council, I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. 
May it please the court, Beth Nussbaum, representing the child, minor child petitioner, Jonathan. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, in terms of the question of the proper presumption and burden and proof, I would argue that the court already has a very well thought out framework for this kind of question. If this court would look by analogy to the post-termination visitation with parental cases such as Ilana, Rico, Vito, John, etc., it's very clear that the judge has very broad discretion and the judge is tasked with weighing the competing interests of the family interest and that's even conceding that this, I'm sorry, you're Is there a case that you can direct us to where there is um, a, uh, I instead of a situation where the siblings really would like to see each other um, and there are impediments to their doing so that the judge is looking uh, at, uh, where the judge is facing a situation where the siblings don't want contact with each other and the judge is making a determination, nope, you're going to have contact. Um, well, I don't know of a case where none of the siblings want contact, but uh, there is a case. It's I mean, we know one sibling here wants contact, but it's the people he wants contact with who don't seem to want Correct. contact. Correct, and I don't him. know of any case where none of the siblings want contact with one another. Um, and may I, I'm not sure why that would be more instructive. I mean, the children, uh, while the court is bound to consider their wishes, children's wishes are never dispositive. They, children don't want to go to school, but they have to go to school. A judge can consider the children's feelings about something, as he did thoughtfully in this matter, and decided that looking at the totality of the evidence, that the visits were in all of the children's best interests. And the point I was making earlier is that the judge is the gatekeeper. These cases are all, as your honors are aware, extremely fact sensitive. And in the case of Ilana, for instance, the court decided that where the adoptive family indicated it was willing to allow visitation, that it was appropriate in that case to leave that decision with the adoptive parents. And that- Back to what you just said yes. before you skip by it. Yes. Um, I, I gather there is a conclusory statement that it's in best interest. That's a conclusion. What are the basic facts that support um, there, there seem to be a number on Jonathan's side. Yes, there um, are. But what are they so the, about the, the other two? The facts about Why the, is it good for them? It's, it, it is good for them. Interests. It, it is good for them on general principles. And, and uh, first of all, that we well, have, but do you want to know specific to yeah, these children why is it that, that, that the judge the, found? The yeah. only memories that these children have at this point are being perpetuated and fostered are negative memories. And they may have positive memories, but those memories have not been at all encouraged. There is evidence that the youngest child, Emily, actually indicated to the GAL, this is in the GAL report, that she wanted to have a visit with Jonathan to see how it would go, that she said she thought he might have turned out better. There's very strong evidence in the form of Jonathan's testimony, not only his discussion with the GAL, but his testimony to the court which the court properly found that this is a young man who's very mature, very insightful, empathetic. Yeah. No, no, I got that. And I'm, but that speaks are, to the best interest. It's in the it best interest of the young. But sorry. there's nothing in this record. Yeah. If children, let's say, these were, have, were traumatized, it's not always the case, is it? Unless there's an evaluative jail, which there wasn't in this case. Unless somebody says, for these children, it really makes sense for them to revisit the person who may have harmed them or they think, and just to relearn. Maybe it'll make them better people in terms of their future well-being, that they get to know the person they think is the source of their problems. All that may well be true. I don't see it here. Well, actually, it is here. First of all, the, the reason why Jonathan is, was removed, I must take issue with my sister's characterization, the reason he was removed is because he did make specific, specific allegations of abuse against the guardians. And the guardians ha actually admitted on the record in this matter to locking in, him in his room for many, many hours at a time, uh, withholding well, food, et cetera. I think that the judge specifically didn't go to the box cutters that were found in the room and all those other things that were removed from the Correct, judge's consideration. Correct, uh, my point is that it's, I think I think it's a mistake to, in, to assume Jonathan engaged in self-injurious behaviors. I there was no finding that he harmed the other children. I'm not even suggesting 
that we go there. Okay. So in I terms of- I want to know what findings I should look to as being important should- That the judge found that it would be, that it would be now very what, helpful to these young children. Based on what? based on Jonathan's testimony and the negativity of the guardian's testimony, that they were unreasonable in separating these children from each other, and that these young children- I mean the guardians are unreasonable, but we've often said it doesn't matter what the parents do. What about these children? Yeah, I'm, that I'm the still children, waiting for the The findings. children will benefit from having contact with their mature, healthy, older brother to reestablish this important family connection. Because it's good for them to have this. Because it's good for those young children to have this family relationship. Because in general it's a good idea. Because not only in general it's a good idea, but because in this case, the, this, the guardians severed these children from not just Jonathan, but from almost everyone else in their biological family. Make a difference on these facts if there were actually an expert evaluator who said for these children, it really wouldn't be a great idea until they're a little older and can understand why Jonathan may have done what he did and, and appreciate that this is maybe good for them. It might, it might not, but the fact is in this case, if there is any paucity of evidence, and here I would direct the court to the Cher case, any paucity of paucity of evidence is due wholly and completely to the dead fast obstruction of the guardians. This, Jonathan actually tried to get sibling visitation beginning in 2008. Is, is there any evidence that uh, Jonathan and his two siblings had good relations before they were their relationship was severed? They were raised together from birth. There is evidence that they were raised together from birth and they never lived apart until he was removed. That's all? Um, there, there may be some evidence, I don't know if it was excised or not, but Jonathan, I think, discusses remembering taking care of them. He discusses remember helping his father in their daily care, and it seems that he, in fact, did some, I don't want to say parenting, but some, some very involved older brother um, activities with them. Um, so I think you, there, is, there is evidence of a positive relationship between these siblings prior to the time they moved in uh, with the guardians. Counsel, I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you. Good morning. Department of Children and Families, Lynn Murphy representing the department, and we're here in continuation of our support of Jonathan in his request for visitation. Um, the trial court did not abuse its discretion entering an order for sibling visitation in this case. The order was reasonable, practical, and in consideration of all the children's best interests. I think the court does a good job of laying this out. This was a complicated matter that had many factual twists and turn to it. And I think this is what the discretion is all about. We want to have trial courts having this discretion so they can deal with situations like this and protect the interests of children, their best interests in this why, case. To why should not the guardians who have been, for all practical purposes, the parents of two of the three children not enjoy the presumption that they know what's in the best interest of their two children? Well, for the simple fact that guardians are not parents. They're a creature of statute. I'm sorry, let me interrupt. Our, our clock isn't working. Thank you. Please proceed. Um, the d difference is guardians are a creature of statute. Their powers are enumerated within the statute. Parents have constitutional rights. But don't, doesn't the statute give them parental authority during the... Um, pendency of the guardianship? Well, they do, but it, it gives and, and isn't takes this just away. an exercise of parental authority to say, you know, this is who I want you associating with and this is who I don't want you well, associating with? Well, absolutely, absolutely. Guardians are a form of parent, but they're not a true parent as an adoptive parent, a natural parent that has a constitutional right. That's because it's a very different relationship. They could be removed. They but, can but, be removed. But, but, but these guardians haven't been removed. And so the question is, while they're still guardians, why shouldn't, and, and no one has been attempting to remove them, why shouldn't they be able to function as a parent would in these circumstances? No, because in this circumstance, we have a specific 
sibling visitation statute that says we need to consider the best interests of children and promote visitation. The court has recognized on numerous occasions the importance of sibling visitation. So in this particular case, when you're talking about visitation, you are going to see some interference in a guardian's but, right. But, but the judge's findings with respect to that have to be to determine what's in the best interest of the children. That is correct. Uh, and uh, regardless of what you call it, should there not be some degree of deference or respect from the fact finder when the guardians of, the, of two of the children say it is not in these children's best interest? Should, shouldn't the judge give some deference to their opinion? If the judge ignored that evidence, that would be very troubling. The judge absolutely should consider that evidence. But to give it any presumptive weight, I would disagree with that. And I think the court absolutely considered what these guardians had gone through. And in fact, in his order, he says this has been traumatic for them. We, I can see why they're upset. But the reality, the totality of the circumstances, we have to consider it still is in everybody's best interest, meaning the three children, to have this visitation. And what's the distinction between giving deference and giving a presumption? Well, I think a presumption is then you're starting from a different place. In this case, we started from the inference that visitation is good, and that inference is supported by statute, clear, clearly in statute, by case law, and by the facts of this case, which the, these children were raised together. As my sister said, these, there was no reason that these children were separated but for the hurt feelings of the guardians, if you will. They were very upset, and the situation was well, traumatic. If the Children themselves, at least, isn't there evidence that they were traumatized by being removed, albeit for a couple of weeks or three weeks? Right, yes, there's evidence. You're right, I'm sure. I'm sure. And again, the, the trial court considered that, and it's in the order. But let, me, let me ask you this. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know this record very well, but at least reading the judge's decision, um, do you take the position that one way of reading Judge Collins' decision is that you don't, one doesn't need to get to this presumption or not because it's very clear that on these facts, he considered the guardians, even if he had applied a presumption, they were being unreasonable. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that is, the, uh, he, the judge was very clear. He, he felt that the judge, the, I'm sorry, the guardians were just very unreasonable in their position and that the reasons they articulated for keeping these children apart really had nothing to do with the children, and they were not, they, the trial court did not believe that these were reasons that were articulated were good enough, and they were not connected to the children's best interests. And promoting that relationship, the judge was very concerned about keeping the, those children. children. In, in his findings, did the, did the judge suggest that the two children's opposition to visiting with Jonathan uh, was uh, a, a, a sympathetic mirror of, of what the, uh, the guardians uh, uh, felt about Jonathan. That the, the children were influenced by the guardian? Yes, I think so. Because but did he say that specifically? I think he almost says that. He doesn't say it specifically, but you can see he ta talks about this very sad situation with this deterioration of the family unit and how upset the guardians were and how they how could they not be influenced by the guardians' very strong feelings, not only towards the petitioning child, but to the mother and other siblings. This was a very, this troubled the court. I think you could definitely see from the order that the court was very troubled by this and didn't want this to become the reason why visits would not be allowed and that visits would benefit them and tailored this specific order to say, okay, you know, let's, let's do therapeutic visitations and then if something starts to go awry, the social worker testified, if anything goes awry and it's not in their best interest, I'll stop the visit. So this was the way the court could promote this without um, making any decisions that would be contrary to the interests of the other two children. Counsel, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kara Shead appearing for Mother Appelli in this case. And if I could start with the Blixt question, and I respectfully suggest that the Blixt Analysis is a total red herring in this situation. 
Under Blixt, or the statute at issue in Blixt was Chapter 119.39D concerning grandparent visitation. And in that kind of a situation, in that case, the petitioners were grandparents. And grandparents as a class aren't a subject of concern with respect to their well-being. They're not, they're not entitled to some judicial or legislative concern. On the other hand, children seeking sibling visitation under Chapter 119, Section 26B are very much a subject of state concern. They've been stripped of really all family connections. And so that's the first way to distinguish those two sections of the statute. The second is the identity of the custodian, which I think is well briefed. Parental custodians have a constitutionally based right to the care and control of their children. Guardians just have a statutory, statutory authority. But there's a further reason to distinguish these two, and it goes to the purpose of the statute. In a 26B situation, what has, what has to happen is that a petitioning child in state custody has to present as one in need of contact with his siblings. And it's thereafter the judge's obligation to determine if there's a way to vindicate that child's right and meet the state's obligation to meet, or a mechanism by which the state can meet that obligation and meet that need without doing harm to the other siblings. And so the judge satisfied himself in a conversation with Jonathan that Jonathan was indeed a child in state custody ripped from home and siblings in need of contact with his siblings. He was persuaded that this young man before him was thoughtful and insightful and had matured and from his findings, it strongly suggests that the judge was persuaded that at a minimum, this child didn't present an obvious harm to the other siblings. So, so you're saying that in this context, considering the best interests of all the children, it's okay to consider the best interests of one and the others are defined by it's not harming them. Is that... I, well, I think that as a practical matter, the best way to, or the, the most compelling evidence certainly that something wouldn't be in the best interest of the siblings would be to show, present some evidence that in fact they'd be harmed by it. But I think that the findings and what happened below actually is a little bit more strong than that. So we have the judge having his own experience of this child with whom he has this conversation. And then he hears the guardian's evidence and remember, the Benjamin had a lawyer, Emily had a lawyer, the guardians had a lawyer, Christopher testified on behalf, their older brother testified on behalf of the guardians, and the judge was presented with this thoughtful young man, and that person in front of him did not square with this fossilized characterization of a virtual monster who was a threat to the children. And I think going to Justice Duffley's question about what specifically is there in this record that actually suggests a, an affirmative, not just an absence of harm, but some affirmative good, I think you can read that the judge had this experience of a conflict between history and perception and the actual person in front of him. And in addition to it not being a harm, might have been a positive for the children to actually have the experience to discover that there wasn't a boogeyman in the closet or a monster under the bed, and that perhaps the manifestations of stress that the guardians did testify to it might have been resolved with an opportunity to realize that nobody was going to hurt them, and that it certainly, and if there was hurt, it certainly wasn't going to be at the hands of Jonathan, especially where the order was so incremental, so careful, and so subject on its express terms to additional review if anyone needed to have that happen. Did he speak with the other two children? He didn't. They weren't there to testify. So the witnesses that the guardians presented and that the judge, whose testimony the judge simply didn't credit, was one of the guardians and their older brother. Was any expert involved? There was a GAL who originally spoke with all of the family um, and was with that the social a GAL worker. who was an evaluative GAL under the statute or an attorney GAL with no child developmental expertise? I can't. I, I actually, I, I'm afraid that I, I, can't, I don't know the answer to that. Most of the, the conclusions and recommendations were stricken by agreement. Much of the guardians, all of her interviews 
with all of anybody who could have shed light on what was in the best interest of any of these kids was invited and did speak to the GAL, and that was admitted without any contest. Counsel, your time is up. Thank you very Thank much. You.